Greetings and welcome back to the Skunks. In this episode, we will shed some light on the potential environmental disaster that is lurking in the Gulf of Perea, which is shared between Venezuela and Trinidad and Tobago. The FSO Nabarima, a stranded oil vessel, was on the verge of spilling 1.3 million barrels of crude oil into the Caribbean Ocean. The issue was not being taken seriously and Venezuela was reporting that the vessel was stable. The government of Trinidad then repeated Venezuela's claim that there should be no cause for concern without actually doing their own assessment. This, of course, upset a group of environmental activists called Fishermen and Friends of the Sea, which I nicknamed Fafas because, well, they're fast. They went and visited the site to get a first-hand look at what is happening. Watch. We are here today, October 16. You can see the tilt on the vessel. That is looking like more like a 25 degree tilt. It looks like it's held together with the anchor chains. And that's why it's not flipping. But we don't know how strong the chains are. We know that the vessel is full of crude oil. We know that nothing has been done. We have risked our lives to come out here to collect this information, to share to the public that our government has done nothing. The regional government is not aware of how dangerous it is. And we think it's worth the risk of coming out here because you can see for yourself, we're not imagining it. These are not false images. No one is doing anything. And you can see that it's held together by the anchor chain. And that's not enough. If something goes on, if we have bad weather, there are a number of circumstances that could cause the vessel to flip, to flip and there'll be no recourse. This requires national emergency, calling on the government of Trinidad and Tobago to wake up and do something. It was not until this video was circulated, then is when the issue got some real attention. It has since been reported that a team of experts from the Trinidadian authorities visited the vessel and it is no longer a major environmental risk. But is it really? I have some members of the FAFAS organization online here with me who will give you some more insight into this issue. Greetings, gentlemen. Mud water, mud water. I am Gary Abood, Corporate Secretary of Fishermen and Saint Friends of the Sea, Trinidad and Tobago. I am Alexander Ramirez, the legal officer of Fishermen and Friends of the Sea. Welcome to the channel. Let's jump right into it because people's attention span getting shorter and shorter these days. Tell me a quick bit about Fishermen and Friends of the Sea. Uh, Fishermen and Friends of the Sea has been to the court in Trinidad and Tobago some, oh God, must be 28 times. We're very proud of what we've been able to accomplish, but very ashamed of why we had to go so far to accomplish what we did. Uh, generally because outline approvals and developmental approvals uh, new developmental approvals ought to consider by law environmental safeguards and, and, and human health and community considerations and oftentimes the big developers and the, with the complicity of government planning and government ministers um, grant approvals for projects that endanger human health and non-human health and so that's what we do. All right. So when you visited this vessel about two weeks ago, it was leaning about 30 degrees to the right. Here in Guyana, we became very concerned given our proximity. What's the situation there now? Um, it appears from unconfirmed reports that there are many maintenance crews working on the vessel. Today, a week after we exposed the lies, there were lies stating that the vessel was stable. On the same day that we showed that it had a 25, 30 degree angle, um, tilt or list. Nevertheless, we believe that work is being done on the vessel and a lot of the hydrocarbon is being removed. So, does this mean that we can carry on with our lives and forget about this? It doesn't mean that we're out of the danger zone because transferring oil is a dangerous activity and quite honestly, Trinidad and Venezuela are the most degrading extractors of oil. I hope Guyana doesn't join the ranks of us but we've set such a embarrassing example for Guyana that we fear for Guyana. Uh, there are critical concerns about extractive industries, especially in the marine space. In the first instance, they do seismic surveys which science has shown destroys the zooplankton, the microorganisms in the water. There are no studies yet to show what it does to the microorganisms in the soil, but our layman's knowledge, our fishermen's knowledge tell us that the banks die after the seismic ships pass. There have been extensive seismic surveys done in Guyana. The same frequency of them being done, we've had beachings of whales and dolphins in Trinidad. Um, 
seismic surveys is the first degrading aspect, but after they find the oil and they start extracting it, in Trinidad and Tobago we've had 377 reported oil spills in the past four years, and even though we have legislation and all sorts of fingerprinting requirements that we could easily prosecute the culprits, not a single culprit is prosecuted. We don't expect better for Guyana, but in Venezuela it's even worse. Nobody even has to report an oil spill, so Lake Maracay is a black lake and the 43 Waro tribes that live there no longer can eat the fish and if they do they get sick so it's a terrible 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 uh, system so the question really is more substantially whether the environment is being taken care of and the answer is no the Navarima because of worldwide pressure and stations broadcasts like yours have gotten a lot of negative press so so they pull their socks up. They don't want to be embarrassed in front of the world more than they already are. But we are far from sustainability. Was Venezuela indeed trying to cover up this issue when they first reported on its status? Certainly. Initially, Venezuela did. But because of the videos and the broadcasts and the public information that we feel very proud to have taken risks to broadcast, um, Venezuela now has been caught. And so they cannot cover it up. It's now exposed to the world. If, if, we did, if you look at the video footage and evidence that we submitted in the public eye, you would see that it was in a terrible state. And you can also go and see the footage that the government of Venezuela put out in September the 1st and 15th of September, showing that the Navarino was stable. So while we were saying that it was listing at 27 degrees, they were saying it's stable. And our pictures don't lie. So, Certainly, they attempted to cover up, but they were exposed. So, are you convinced now that they are making a real effort to mitigate the threat of an oil spill? In this instance, they are working to prevent it, yes. But in the probably hundreds of thousands of other instances of spills, recorded and unrecorded, reported and reported, we don't think the PDRC is any better than our local oil company. And like I say, I fear for Guyana, um, because we don't, in our region, we don't have a track record of responsible extractive industries. Our legislation, both here and especially in Guyana, is just in its infancy stages and it will take decades after the legislation is passed and billions of dollars for proper institutional and infrastructural capacities to enforce the legislation. So I don't think it's a blessing what Guyana is about to experience. It, there will be wealth, but there are different types of wealth. Um, one is monetary wealth, one is lifestyle wealth, health wealth, ecosystem wealth. Um, and the potential of ecosystem stability is, is an infinite value as well. So people will say, well, we have money, so we could afford to say that. It's, it's a deep philosophical question um, whether or not we should dig every penny out of the earth compromise our health. All you have to do is go and look at the statistics of frequencies of degenerative diseases here in Trinidad compared to Guyana and you'll see where you're heading. And 20 years from now we can have a conversation about it. For those of you who are skeptical about our hypotheses. But it's more simply put it's called the resource curse hypotheses, which is no longer a hypothesis is that countries that experience sudden wealth experience sudden poverty because the wealth, having not been earned by the sweat of one's brow, is blown away by politicians wanting to be re-elected and in projects that are unsustainable and not uh, economically generating projects. So 20 years from now, the oil and gas will be finished in Guyana and you would have become accustomed to a splurge of freeness as we have. And then we we'll see, uh, we can have a debate about the resource curse. Uh, of course, we hope Guyana would learn and listen to the elders and those who have studied this subject, but it's a deep concern to us what Guyana is about and Suriname is about to experience. If Nabarima had flipped and spilled her cargo, what kind of dangers were you anticipating that caused you to risk your life to expose this? It would affect tourism, fishery activity, the reputation of this region as a clean, cool area to be in. It would affect um, communities that depend on the sea could affect human health and last but 
probably for this, it would, it would affect the integrity and health of the ecosystem itself. The voiceless creatures, the lobsters and the dolphins and turtles. Many of you may not know that five of the seven marine turtles that exist on planet Earth exist in the Caribbean Sea and come to Trinidad. And many of them go to Guyana as well. They would all be affected. So. It would be devastating. Why wasn't your government showing much concern for this? I mean, eventually they did. It took two months of, of letter writing and appeals to the public, appeals to the press, and for them to sit up and look. It took us going across from the national borders to get video footage of what was quite clearly a listing vessel for them to finally show some sort of concern. But at the same time, I don't think it's enough because they did not provide any video evidence of the vessel. And we basically have to say that we trust that your experts have said that this vessel is upright. All right, finally, before we boom out of here, any final thoughts? Where do we stand right now on this? It is slightly less urgent than it was a week ago. International reports and satellite imagery have shown that there are there are two oil tankers presently attempting to remove the oil and the government of Trinidad and Tobago said that said yesterday in their press conference that the intention is to remove all the oil within 35 days. However, there can still be spills during the transfer of this oil and from the information we have received there are no oil booms around the tanker to contain these spills. More than that, there's still the, the ongoing secrecy where we sent an entire, an entire team to Venezuela to inspect the vessel, but we have not been provided one image or one video because it is apparently an asset. So they're, they're saying on the one hand that everything is stable, but they haven't provided us with any videographic evidence. Um, what, uh, what I would like to, to respond about what we need people to know. We need people to know that we are spending hundreds of millions of dollars on ministries of foreign affairs and on United Nations officers living in luxurious dwellings and embassies with full complements of staff which who are paid triple digit salaries and have all of the luxuries and trappings of the 1%. You know, they have chauffeurs and caviar and the best of food and who is paying for that in countries where they have, there's malnutrition, in countries where there's infrastructural and institutional deficiencies, where legislation is lacking and lapsing? We come from the third world and we think that what we would like to see is that we would like our diplomats of Guyana and Suriname and Jamaica and Trinidad and Barbados and St. Vincent which is home to the head of CARICOM. We would like our diplomats to start working on several things, on joint representations to the United Nations, to the Organization of American States, to ensure that we can be considered in international assistance, particularly for the impacts of global warming and climate change, which although our net discharge of of, uh, of, of, of carbon footprint may be high per capita. It's minuscule as a region and as nations. And yet we pay the price of global warming. We've had more and will have more hurricanes this year than in the history of the planet. We now have Sargassum seaweed, which is 26 feet deep. It's like an island, you can walk on it. It's impenetrable and it washes ashore, destroying beaches and and, and displacing ecosystems and, and species. We, we think we need to have a joint position at, at, in, as an, in, as an in, international entity to address issues of global warming and climate change, but we should also have a joint agreement to share information and to assist each other at times of of, of, of threats such as this threat, oil spill threats, Guyana, Suriname, Trinidad, Venezuela, 
and now Barbados, Belize and the Bahamas will be engaging in oil and oil extraction and so will face the impact of oil and oil extraction and the impact is interregional. So we should have a joint and unified body, not CARCOM. It should include the French territories, the Dutch territories, the Spanish and Latino territories and the Caribbean English speaking territories as well. Okay, gentlemen, thank you for spending some time with me today. Uh, we thank you for listening to us and we hope that we've been able to share some wisdom. Certainly. Y'all take good care until next time. Bless you, Madwata. I like your name, Madwata. Bye for now. Yo, that's it for this episode. My name is Madwata. Boom out. Hold up.